Good evening and welcome everybody once again to another episode of the Wisconsin Conservative Conversations. I'm your host, Ed Delgado, and as you guys know, every time I have the opportunity, every chance I get, I want to talk to candidates running across every race. I don't care if it's an assembly, gubernatorial race, lieutenant governor, dog catcher, if they do such a thing. But I would love to have these conversations because, as I told you before, I want to try to bring value in education so that people are actually able to listen to the candidates, understand their message, and more importantly, get a human perspective of these candidates because oftentimes you'll see them on the TV, you'll hear them on the radio, but there's something different than when you actually get to meet folks. And our guest here tonight, I, I really like him because uh, we had the opportunity to meet, I'm gonna say this was back in October. It was in Manasha and there was a rally up there and it was called the Cow Event, Calumet, Ottagamy, Winnebago County. They had an event there and really well attended. And this gentleman here, I hadn't had the opportunity yet to meet yet. And for the first time we met and he gave me the opportunity to speak with him for at least 15, 20 minutes. And to me, that's a privilege. Anytime I have the opportunity to speak with an individual or they can give me their time, it is certainly a privilege. And I'd like to introduce him to you guys to him right now. This is Kevin Nicholson. Kevin Nicholson is one of the candidates running on the Republican side of the ticket for the governor's race here in the state of Wisconsin. Kevin Nicholson, how are you, sir? I'm doing well, Ed. Thanks for having me. And Semper Fi, really like the shirt, Hi. too. That's <laughs> I, didn't I have bias that formal, way. But I, it's a conversation, right? So I figure, you know, you exactly. don't have to get dressed up. <laughs> you really don't. Um, even though, you know, occasionally I will sport a tie. I do the black shirt, but that's kind of my signature look. Yeah. Um, like Johnny Cash. What's that? Like Johnny Cash. Exactly. <laughs> uh, except I'm not talented enough to string a guitar, but that's a whole nother story. <laughs> so I want to get into this here right from the get go. Um, one of the things your name came to my attention, I think a lot of other people within the state of Wisconsin back in 2017, 2018, mm -hmm. as you were running for state senator at that time. You were uh, in the US, primary. U.S. Senate. U.S. Senate, yes. Yep. I said, did I say state Senate? Excuse me. Yep. Uh, no, that's okay. that's what happens when you hit a certain age there. <laughs> but that's obviously when your name became more into the public eye and stuff. And one of the things I like to get insight on is why would why get involved in state politics considering the level of scrutiny and everything that you do you put your life on hold um obviously you're doing it again this time on the gubernatorial side of things there's a lot that comes at running for an office kind of break down the motivation of why you want to serve in these in this capacity it's an excellent question, and it's it's a good one to ask anybody that's put their name on a ballot. And for my wife and I, as we made this decision to run for the Senate, as you said, in 2018, run for governor this time, because we see like serious problems with our society. And and some of these problems were not as acute in 2018 or 2017 when I, when I launched the U.S. Senate campaign, but I felt them coming in many respects. I didn't see COVID coming per se, but when you see the problems that we were already facing and everything from education to national debt to all the things that are hanging off our country right now that are creating such enormous risks our thought is look if you have something to offer you stand up and you offer it as a leader and it's so much of what you and i were taught in the marine corps speaking of the marines it's like hey problem identified let's get after it and you either are part of solving it or you're probably part of perpetuating it and so that's the attitude and um and, you know when we lost that senate race my wife and i and our family and team didn't sit around and cry like life move forward. Um, I always tell people, a, a senator that I like, a U.S. Senator, incumbent U.S. Senator, Republican, um, and I talked after I lost that U.S. Senate race in 18, and he's like, hey, you know, you should just go take a vacation, get away with your family for a few weeks, like, just get away. And I thought, you know, it's a nice sentiment, and he was trying to be, you know, helpful, but, you know, my kids got football starting tomorrow. <laughs> like, <laughs> life moves forward. I'm back to work, right. too. I never stopped working my private sector job. And, uh, and so you charge right back at it. And then we founded No Better Friend, and we did great stuff around the state, growing the conservative movement. And then when it came time for this, uh, this election, our thought was, look, at the end of the day, problems are worse now than they were just several years ago. And again, if you feel like it's an imperative that we win this coming November, it's an imperative that we get the world back on track, you step up. And to your point, you do face real scrutiny. And that scrutiny sometimes 
um, it's fair and justifiable. Like you'll ask me questions today and I'll answer them and people will hear it. That's great. That's scrutiny. And then sometimes it'll be crazy scrutiny coming from the mass media. That's just looking any which way they can to cause a problem for a Republican. But at the end of the day, you navigate that and you, you go through that because the goal is to put good ideas forward so that our kids don't grow up in a world that's falling apart. Well, and I think that's, you know, I, I definitely share that sentiment there because, you know, I've kicked around the idea personally about running for an office. And then I kind of look at some of the other folks that have done things and some of the folks that are currently incumbent. And I'm like, all right, I don't necessarily know if I'm ready for that, but I am definitely ready to make sure that I can spread a message and hopefully a message that resonates positively, brings forth education and shows my son that, you know, because I have three kids and it's, it's a big deal because you right. want to be that role model that says, you know, hey, guys, even when all opposition is coming against you, you can stand in the face of that because you knew something was wrong. So you stood for it was something that was right. Right. hundred percent. Yes. That's that's the legacy that we need to leave to all of our children. Right. In that uh, times will become difficult. You're going to face challenges, uh, but you have to step up and, and do your darndest to at any given moment to before the best solution, defeat the threat, whatever that threat might be. And, you know, again, that is what you're taught in the Marine Corps. It's what I've tried to carry into my private sector job. Anything I've done in public life, politics, whatever, is provide the solution and move it forward. And I think that for better or for worse, if we had more people in public life that had that mentality, uh, we certainly wouldn't be in the predicament that we are today. We would not have seen the insanity of the last two years where the world was turned upside down that we wouldn't have children being taught in Wisconsin schools to, you know, hate themselves in their country. Um, you know, it's a pretty low bar to move beyond the current status quo. Um, but we need more people to step up with just the attitude of like, look, come what next, like we need to fix this now and we need to get the world back on track. Well, and it's interesting you mentioned, you know, to fix that, fix this pro these problems now. And that's certainly, I think the right approach because we have to look at it. We got to get started now because these problems didn't just arise overnight. I mean, if you look really deep into some of them, we're talking a generation or two that these issues have crept up. And I think oftentimes as conservatives, we have acquiesced ground. I mean, I'll give you a great example. Education is probably the one of the key ones right there because what did we do as conservatives? We backed away from school boards like, yeah, I don't really have time to go to a school board meeting. I don't have time to go to a town meeting. I don't have time for this. I'm working, I'm tired. We can always make excuses. The cities are no different. And, and I'll take full accountability on my end. In 2014, we left Milwaukee. I mean, like you said, you, you saw the writing on the wall. You didn't necessarily sure. know what was going to happen. Sure. But it was like, yeah, I'm out. I can't deal with this. So we left. But that doesn't help places like Milwaukee or Green Bay right. or other major cities like that. Um, so we I have think, invested in this, and, and you're right. And look, and it, to be to the point of your family, you have to do what's best for your individual family. But we as conservatives need to be invested in getting our major cities back on track. We've got violence at record high in Milwaukee. Uh, basically, we, we set the record for murders last year already with the pace is 25 percent ahead of what it was last year. So it's on pace to break the record again. That's for murder, let alone the other violence that's occurring, the drug abuse, the the lack of economic, excuse me, economic opportunity, and then also yeah. too, the just the the horrific state of Milwaukee public schools. Like again, this is all intrinsically tied together. It has to be fixed. This is why I'm an advocate of universal school choice and why we fought for it at No Better Friend as well, because we got to get money attached to students and allow students to get out of family environments. That's what helps to break this horrible cycle that we're seeing of bad education leading to more and more violent outcomes or bad interactions right. with police. You get kids on a better trajectory early in life and it can change everything right off the get go. So, but that means we as conservatives, you know, sure, there, there might not be an abundance of Republican votes right now today in Milwaukee. It is still to everybody's benefit in the state of Wisconsin that Milwaukee be a functioning world-class city. And it, it is not today. Um, and so the engine of our state's economy in so many different ways, the state's largest city, um, has in too many ways been ignored by too many conservatives. And that's right. just not what I would do as governor. You got to get in there, tackle schools. You got to work with the city to actually get people to want to be police officers again, because the problem right now is that they don't want to be. Uh, right. Like Tony Evers threw them under the bus after incidents like the Kenosha officer involved shooting. So there's, there's a lot of work to be done here, but part of it means just being present, showing up. This is right. why No Better Friend, we, 
we were in Milwaukee, we were in Green Bay, or in La Crosse, or in Eau Claire, we're all across the state in Racine, Kenosha. Um, and sir, we talked to plenty of conservatives, but we also talked to many people who weren't conservatives, explaining what we believed and explaining how conservative ideas like school choice empower people to succeed. That's how you start to build relationships. But well, and I'm glad you said that because I know there's definitely a theme that I'm going to go with here, and that's you know, of course, building relationships. And one of the things that I've noticed ever since you launched No Better Friend, and for those people that are kind of like not in the know, it's a play on a Marine Corps phrase mm -hmm. that says that there's no better friend, no worse enemy. Yep. And one of the things that I really respected about your organization here was the advocacy of bringing these this information out to the forefront. Especially, you know, even if you're a conservative and you like to think that you're a diehard conservative, diehard Republican, you may not necessarily be as knowledgeable on something like CRT or, um, you know, let's say tax policy or anything mm -hmm. else like that. You guys have done a lot of work. What was the the what was the launching point for you and the decision to want to put a team together like you've got and go forward with that during the time between? 18 in, in 2022. Yeah. Well, you know, like I said, I lost that primary. And since I lost that primary, we've lost as Republicans 11 out of 12 statewide general elections. It's not a good track record. It is a problem. And it's a problem, particularly when the cost of losing to the left is as high as it is. Because again, this is sure we have debates about our property taxes. Conservatives want them lower. Liberals want them higher. But this is a far more fundamental debate. We've got the left trying to teach through our schools our children to hate themselves and their country. I mean, those are the real stakes that of what's happening right now, in addition to other, again, violence, crime, all the other things that the left is perpetrating that we have to stop. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, what I said to, to friends, supporters, and others, like, what do, you know, we're asking the question, what do we do to grow our movement? I said, one of the things we can do is found a group, which literally, in a number of different ways, through messaging, through physical events, or, or it maintains a presence throughout the state of Wisconsin, that goes and explains what conservatism is, what we believe, and how we can forward and advance society through these beliefs. And really, we did, through No Better Friend, convene thousands of people across the state, as you said, to fight critical race theory, to advocate for school choice, to protect the unborn, uh, and you know, fight for market forces in healthcare, any number of different things. Uh, back the badge events, we had back the badge events right. throughout the state of Wisconsin at a time there weren't many of those, uh, you know, we saw the problem like so many others did and said, let's get police officers in front of their communities so they can actually talk about the challenges that they're seeing here today and what we can do to help them. And very much a great give and take happened throughout those communities. And we did a number of those, but like that, that was the idea. And again, we were in the north side of the Milwaukee doing uh, book bag giveaways to talk to local residents about how school choice is not only good for their kids, but it's, it's conservatives that are out there fighting for that because right. not everybody knows that because the media doesn't talk about it. Right. So, you know, we got a thousand kids to the Wisconsin State Capitol. Uh, Vice President Pence flew in uh, for the event, too. We worked with some other great groups and we partnered with them as well to do this. But the message was like these kids were there to celebrate their education. Tony Evers actually left the Capitol that day. I mean, it, really? <laughs> the state, yes, that happened. That's real. And wow. legislators uh, held a press conference that day while the kids were still in the building saying that we need to shut down these school choice programs. Why? Because the teachers unions told them to. And I didn't say the teachers. I said the teachers right. unions. And so, you know, in that one moment, it says so much, right? The, all the Republican legislators were there. Our partner groups were there, like School Choice Wisconsin. They're all there. They're all fighting uh, for the kids. And the Democrats are there fighting to shut down the programs at the behest of the teachers unions. So not only we were we promoting a great policy in school choice, we were also very much calling out the dichotomy of conservatives versus the left and who's really there for these kids when, we, right. when they need us to be there as well, too. So that's why we found a No Better Friend. That's why I'm proud of the work that it did. And, um, you know, it'll have a different manifestation in the future. And we'll figure that out right now. We got a governor's race to win. Um, but at the end of the day, it, it reached a lot of people. It has reached a lot of people. Right. Really, honestly, with the messaging, millions of people across the state of Wisconsin. And, you know, it, it brought our ideas to people in a good way. You know, it's, and it's interesting because, it, you know, as I've talked with other people and I've talked with yourself, and obviously I, I think out of your, your entire team, I, I probably know Christopher Lawrence the, the most. I've known sure. him for a number of years. Great guy. Mm -hmm. um, he is. But one of the things that when 
it was an article I read. I want to say it was about a year, year and a half ago. And it talked about yourself mm -hmm. as being one of the most prominent conservative voices here in Wisconsin. And I want to kind of take a trip back in time here because <laughs> we all have different positions in life. Uh, sure. You know, we our mindset changes based upon our growth, our maturity, our experiences. I myself at one point was a diehard liberal. I was all about <laughs> wealth redistribution and paying the little guy and until I realized that my career aspiration shouldn't be SpongeBob SquarePants and that <laughs> I should never be a fry cook for life unless I'm an owner operator of McDonald's. But that's a whole nother story. Well, maybe that is actually relevant. Oftentimes you've been criticized because you were a Democrat at one point, and I mm -hmm. believe it was the president of the college of public uh, Democrats at that point. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of notable conservatives and probably the most prominent one that, that I don't think anybody would dispute is a solid conservative is Thomas Sowell, mm -hmm. politician, writer, econ economist. Um, right. Just go, let's go into a little bit of that transition that, that when the real world kind of hit you and you were like, wow, when did that yeah. happen? Yeah. No, I'm, I'm happy to. And as you mentioned, this is not a path. You and I have walked this path. Many have walked this path. Vicki McKenna will often talk about having walked this path. Ronald Reagan walked this path, was a Democrat uh, in his 50s, not long before he was elected uh, governor of California, when he said enough's enough and moved on and obviously became one of the greatest conservative leaders in our nation's history. And for me, um, and I, I say this to audiences all the time, like I was born into a family of Democrats. My grandfather was the person that talked to me most about politics and life. And I'd spend my weekends with him. He lived in West Dallas, Wisconsin, and he was a World War II vet. And he was a great guy, lifelong uh, Mason, me and Mason, meaning like a construction worker, Mason yeah. builder and um, great guy uh, would come later in life to disagree with him on, you know, politics, but we'd spend our weekends together. We'd walk across McCarty Park in West Dallas. For those that know it, it's near Very Center. familiar. Yep. And there's a, there used to be a boy blue over in 84th and Lincoln. We'd walk all the way there and get ice cream. We'd walk back through the canals and the whole way there, he talked to me about, you know, the wonders of the new deal and the time that he saw Franklin Roosevelt, the North side of Milwaukee drive by him in his car and uh, how enamored he was with that like experience. And then the way back, he'd usually complain about Ronald Reagan because it was the eighties and he was retired. And that's what he did. He'd also yell at talk show radio hosts, uh, but they wouldn't hear him, but he'd do it. <laughs> right. So some of the same hosts that I actually go on, uh, I go on radio now today and talk about uh, the challenges we face. It's kind of weird, but nonetheless, um, that was when I knew of like politics. I was told I was to be a Democrat. And so, you know, that's what I thought I was. And I went to college, as you said, I got involved, ended up being elected national president of the College of Democrats of America. Um, thought I knew a lot and I didn't. And what I, what I found out when I saw the Democrat party up close, especially kind of like in the heart of the DNC was, was things I didn't like, like the spread and the inception of identity politics. And uh, I didn't know this. It was 1999. It's now near a quarter century ago, which it is pretty crazy that people are still bringing this up as an attack. I'm happy to talk about it the way you and I are, because certainly I think it's important people hear this, but like as an attack, it's, I mean, it's pretty, pretty thin gruel at this point, but nonetheless, um, what I saw and I didn't know then was that uh, identity politics are an outcropping of critical race theory. And critical race theory is the academic found in intellectual foundation of the, the left's idea that, you know, people should be pitted against each other on the basis of race. Historical blame should be assigned to people on the basis of skin color. I thoroughly believe this is a violation of the Civil Rights Act where it's perpetrated. But in 1999, what we saw was the beginning of identity politics. And I knew enough at that point in my life to say, hey, I don't want any part of this. This is bad stuff. And I just got away from politics and I just moved a different direction with life. Uh, I did. I ran a newspaper for a year. Um, I, after that, went out and I worked as a cowboy in Wyoming on a small cattle ranch because logically that's what you do after you run a newspaper, There's right? A good correlation there. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Perfect. I totally, I totally yeah. see the, 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 the yes. lead there. You saw where my career was headed, right? Yeah. So I, <laughs> I did that for about a year. I married my wife, Jesse. I joined the Marine Corps in 04. I served in 09. I fought in Iraq in 07, Afghanistan, 08, 09. I don't need to tell you how much that changes you, right. your perspective. Every one of these steps in my life just made me more practical and made me more conservative because your illusions get stripped away. And I always tell people, you want your illusions stripped away? Join the Marines in the middle of two wars. Like they will make sure that you, <laughs> you get down to brass tacks, you come to understand reality versus, you know, 
your fantasy. Like they'll, they'll make those two very, those, the difference between those things very clear. And so for me, that all made me more conservative. I got out of the Marine Corps in 09. Uh, I went to graduate school at Harvard and Dartmouth for business and government. This ended up being another process whereby, you know, I saw a lot of people with great credentials and saw that there was oftentimes a lack of common sense behind those credentials. And you could ask hard questions of what were supposed to be the world renowned experts on things. And sometimes, yes, you can learn great things from them. And sometimes you can see like, oh, this is a paper thin idea. Like I had to go to business school and this was, I guess it would have been 2009-10 when um, a lot of, lot of people are talking about healthcare, right? Right. And I'm mean, here listening to experts get up and lecture about healthcare at business school and talking about how the VA is running this great government run healthcare system that should be emulated. Well, here I'm a veteran and I know better because I've gone to the VA. Which, it's like, have you been to Zablocki? I mean, yeah, it's exactly like, right. If and you so, go down to Great Lakes Medical Center, that was like a whole different world because they put up that new facility. I mean, they spent like millions of dollars, gorgeous facility. Um, my ex-wife who was in the Navy, she's a, okay. she was a nurse and she was, uh, we were stationed there and which was okay. Awesome. When you went there, but you go to Zablocki and it's like, oh, what did I walk back into? Yeah. Like you, you felt like there was a time warp there and it was I like, know. no, this is not the model. Right. And then of course we found out what happened at, at the King Medical Center, uh, with the candy man out there, that incident several years back. Right. So yeah, it's not really a good analogy. No, it's not. But yet you. You go back to 2010, you can find a whole the the left, the left uh, leaning think tanks were all putting out the VA as this kind of model. And the joke of it always was too. one of the things they would say is the VA's model because of their use of electronic medical records, because that was this great cost saving uh, technology that was going to be the advancement of all medical. You know, once we have full government run um, health care, it would all be great because they'd all have electronic medical records. Both you and I know if you go to a VA care center, you got to bring a duplicate copy of your hard copy medical record, because when you turn it over, they're going to lose it. That's just 101. Everyone knows that. And so here I am sitting there in these, you know, vaunted institutions, Dartmouth, Harvard, sometimes learning some really great stuff and sometimes being like, these people are just making this stuff up. And boy, what a great lesson to learn in life to understand that, and especially I think the time I learned it after being in the Marine Corps, right? After having been, you know, thinking I was a hot shot when I was, uh, you know, 20 years old going on national TV as a college Democrat, which is ridiculous. I was on TV, but I was <laughs> and so like these processes, every evolution just made me more conservative and practical. And then finished grad school in 2012. I went and I first worked for a firm called McKinsey, then now a firm called GH Smart. So I've worked in the private sector, which again, makes you practical. You got to solve problems. If you don't solve the problem. You don't, you don't keep the job. And it's that mentality that like, I think is just a, made me into the conservative item today where I can articulate why I believe what I do, why I came to the positions that I did. And I think it's very helpful for talking to people who don't always already agree with us, um, which that's the future. And if we're going to be honest about it, we have to convince many, many, many millions of people across the country to make the transition that you and I have to become a conservative. And if we don't do that, and if we don't win these intellectual and moral arguments, um, there's going to be no help coming from the national media, from the entertainment industry, uh, who are all, frankly, pushing messages that are destructive to our society and that are destructive in many cases to people's success. Yeah. And I'm glad that you said that because I want to transition to this next topic. And I feel like, you know, you and I could probably do an easy two, three hours doing this. As a matter of fact, I don't. I think there may have been one guest I have had where an hour was kind of enough and that's because they were running for a, a smaller assembly race sure. but most people i can probably do an easy two three hours because yeah. <laughs> there's so much to unpack here right um but you mentioned something i think that is oftentimes overlooked and i don't know if there's a political answer to this and and when we take a look at issues like inflation mm -hmm. crime uh obviously crt uh we take a look at what's going on culturally and a lot of people seem to overlook that cultural aspect of it right we see a lot of and, and there's been a decline especially within the inner city for a number of years i'd say going back into the late 60s 70s and then just accelerating from the 90s on mm -hmm. uh, let's start there because i think we can legislate all day long mm -hmm. how can we as conservatives influence culturally when the left literally control all the cultural institutions 
So you bring up an incredibly important point. And so it's actually a Democrat U.S. Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan who says that said that uh, politics is downstream from culture. And yes. he's right. He's correct. And that is what the left has been very adept at understanding. That is why so many political messages are sent through everything from your streaming services, your movies, um, TV shows, whatever, whatever, right? Like it's there and it's embedded. And it's very important to the left that those messages be embedded because they know that it has the ability to shift the political discussion very, very quickly. And by quickly, I can mean a matter of a couple of years, things that we never thought we'd be talking about, Correct. suddenly we're talking about. And not just talking about, we're seeing legislated or implemented in into law in ways that we never you know, thought we would have uh, occur. And so that is, you know, if I'm going to give an answer, I'm not going to take over a Hollywood studio anytime soon. That's not in my <laughs> I appreciate Elon Musk saying that like enough's enough with Twitter. I'm just going to buy the thing, see if I can fix it. Right. I hope that that deal goes through and I hope that he's true to his word. I don't know him personally, um, but it sounds like he's got generally the right idea, which is that we cannot have. And I know there's some disagreement about it, but I said this years ago, Twitter, unfortunately, has in some ways become a town square it for is. opinion makers, for opinion makers, not for your yes. average person, because the average person never sees Twitter, but um, and to, to their benefit, like the less time there, the better. But the reality is that, yes, these things that are happening culturally are affecting what is uh, in play in terms of politics and legislation and policy. So the, given that we're probably not going to take over all the Hollywood studios or streaming studios, probably, you know, again, hope that Elon can pull off what he does. But we got to admit, right. generally social media, social media tilts hard left. What we need to do is look at our schools. And this is why I believe the universal school choice is so important. And those are, in so many ways, incubators of the most, the second most important culture that kids encounter behind their families. Um, and, and I'm saying that in part because fewer and fewer people are going to church right now. And so right. you think about where you're spending your time. It's with your family, ideally with your church, too, and then in your school if you're a kid. Um, and so that's why I believe that we have to basically uncap this system and create a market I want complete curricula transparency and I want money following students so that parents yes. say, look, we've got an average now of 27 to 29% proficiency in the state of Wisconsin for ranging for, for math and for language arts. That's horrific. Like, let's just start with that. That's horrific. We can't continue right. that way. Then we're seeing poison like critical race theory, which again, I believe is a violation of the civil rights act being taught in our schools in addition to other, you know, bizarre curricula that needs to be stopped so that we can get back to actually teaching kids proficiency in math and language arts. So let's allow parents to go to administrators and say, look, either you fix it or my kid's leaving. And if that ends up being the case, we'll see bad schools close and we will see new schools open. Schools that have cultures that ultimately incubate success. And that's what I think the market will drive. So to your point, I don't think we can fix every negative influence that's reaching children but if we can fix one of the primary environments in which they're learning, like, how do you behave? What do you value? What do you take is the most important thing in life? We can fix that. We can do a lot to, to the words not even box out, but we can do a lot to override the negativity that's coming from some other, you know, so many other facets of life. Certainly. And I think that's an important thing to note that, you know, schools are a part of culture. And I don't think a lot of people realize that they think movies, media, uh, you know, um, music. But in reality, if you look at the shift that's been happening, the shift that's happened with the implementation of CRT yeah. with, before the soft launch of it prior to uh, the 1619 project gaining ground. Yeah. And you have students now going to select, what do they call it? SEL, selective emotional learning. Right. Uh, I don't really need my kid like getting in touch with his feelings. I need him to be able to balance a checkbook. Yeah, you know, right. like, yes. I don't know. Call me crazy, but I, you know, your money's kind of important, right? Right. You know, you, no, you're you're right. Be, oh, I'm sorry, sir. Go ahead. No, I, I think you're 100 percent right. And um, so much of what has been pushed into our schools, again, is a very intentionally divisive message that is meant to incubate in kids' minds this perception that they are fundamentally different from people that don't look like them. It is a direct assault on the civil rights movement, the Civil Rights Act of 1964. It's flying in the face of what Americans have been fighting for for so many decades in our country, or really not just decades, but centuries in our country. Yeah. Extend the promise of America to everybody and say, okay, now we've legally extended it. 
Now let's culturally extend it. Let's get there. We're one people, you know, it doesn't matter what you look like. doesn't matter where your ancestors came from. You're an American, you're here. Now let's figure out how to do this thing together in a way that no other human society has or ha ever has. Unfortunately, the left figured out that, and then when they, you can, we used to, you know, we did our symposiums on critical race theory at No Better Friend. We literally flew in um, speakers uh, from across the nation to talk about this. And what they'll lay out for you is that the Marxist underpinnings of critical race theory, yeah. and it's coming from professors that were teaching at, um, at um, law schools in America, uh, they were socialists. They were about socialists. A number of them were socialists from Germany who came over and were teaching in American law schools. And these are Marxist philosophies that are meant to separate, divide people. And then again, for the left, that's great because it ultimately flows power back to them. In my mind, a republic cannot work. You know, a multiracial, multi-ethnic republic cannot work unless people believe that they are of one people. And I think the left full well understands that, the hard left, and their goal is to rip that whole thing apart as best they can so that they can, again, take power from people, consolidate it in government, as leftists have been trying to do their entire existence. Yep. And I think that's a very important distinction that you made, you mentioned, because I don't think people realize that CRT has its roots in, in Marxism, because according to the Marxist, Marxist doctrine, it was pitting classes against classes. Well, here in America, here's the beauty of America. Right. This is why I love this country so much. Um, you can be rich one day, you can be broke the next, mm -hmm. and then you have the opportunity to get right back up on the horse and try again. Right. You no, know, I've fallen, I've gotten back up. Right. Uh, you know, I mean, it happens and no other country allows you to slide up and down or if you're starting here you can ascend if you put in the work if you put in the knowledge if you if you do all the things that you're supposed to do and it's funny and i'm going to date myself here i grew up in a time where we were literally told don't judge a man based on the color of their skin based upon based upon the value of their character right and it just blows my mind on how fast I shouldn't say how fast because now I think back and this is like 20 years now. But it just seems like it, it disintegrated so incredibly quickly. Yeah. And it's infected everything. And I think that's also one of the reasons why we have the crime that we have today because we're pushing all this nonsense, social promotion. And what are students to do, especially in the inner city? Well, you know, and you mentioned Thomas Sowell before. And he writes, uh, you know, he was writing on kind of concepts we're talking about right now long yes. before the last couple of years right but basically he can write incredibly eloquently on in, in every one of his books about the fact that, you know he grew up in harlem at a time facing real discrimination it was a real thing um but that uh you know at that point in history uh black americans had a, a higher rate of intact families than yes. um than white americans did you know and he writes about that very bluntly and like how good that was for people that were being raised in that in, in those communities at that point and how important it was uh, in his own life. And so talks about these things very clearly and very, pre you know, and, and lays it out and saying, but, you know, what has come from the left has been an attempt to pick that apart and to destroy it and much to the detriment of all of America. And um, and then it, again, it's this idea that, of course, the country is imperfect. It's formed by people. People are imperfect. Yeah. We all understand that or. Um, but if we can accept that, we can also say there's really no other story in world history of what the American people have done, right? Like founding this country through a bloody revolution, which is, mm -hmm. we were asked about this in a debate the other day, like, you know, what is what is conservatism? And in my mind, it's it's the belief the individual is sovereign here on earth, rights given by God to us directly. That's in essence what founds the country, right? Our founders Absolutely. say, hey, yeah, I want no more monarchy. I want nothing of it. You know, I am my own sovereign here while I'm on earth. And by so doing, we create this new thing. We fight a bloody civil war to extend the promise to everybody. As you know, we send our soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines repeatedly out across the globe where they, and this is not hyperbole, they literally defeated armies of darkness and Correct. literally freed entire peoples. Like no other human uh, population has ever done what the American people have done to free other people in so many different places in so many different ways. And then back home, yeah, we passed the Civil Rights Act to codify that you can't discriminate against people. 
on the basis of race. And so it's this amazing story of progress. There's setbacks, there's challenges, there's ugliness at times, there's beauty at others, but like it is an amazing story. And it's something all of our kids should grow up understanding. It's something that new immigrants to this country, again, people should come here legally, but immigrants to this country you should come to understand, like this is the legacy you want to inherit. It's pretty amazing when all things considered, a lot of weight on your shoulders that you can actually take it and improve upon it. But that's what we want you to do is to continue to improve upon it. Um, that's a reasonable conversation to have that we can have with our children, that we can have with our, you know, again, people that immigrate to this country legally. We can have these conversations and just frame a reference like, you know, we didn't do everything in the world, you know, everything in this country perfectly, but we've done so much. Yes. So don't mess it up and take it forward, continue to make it better. But you're not going to make it better by trying to rip it down, which is clearly what the left is trying to do in our schools, our corporations, heck, even in the U.S. military. And well, I just saw that apparently in the Navy, uh, you can be written up for mispronouncing somebody. And, you know, here's the thing. Like, I remember when I joined the Marine Corps, like, you know, this too. I, not everyone's a saint, right? Like, there's plenty of stuff. You, you, you bump it. You bump heads with guys at times, too. But the overriding message of the culture was you're a Marine. Mm -hmm. Like you will take, you will accomplish the mission. Number one, number two, you're going to take care of your fellow Marine. Yeah. And like, and if you're a good Marine, you're a good Marine and everyone's going to know it. If you yeah. are not a good Marine, I'll, I'll, I'll reserve. There's a word for that, but we'll <laughs> save that for another day. <laughs> I'll hold on that. But if you're not, everyone's going to know that too. Yeah. And, you know, the expectation is you're going to go improve yourself. And if you don't like, that's really, actually, you know what? That was the other thing I learned about the Marine Corps too. Hey, you know what? In training, you start out at zero. You're not good. You know, people give you a hard time, but you improve fast. Everyone's yep. going to love it. Right. And that was just so much what was there in the Marine Corps. And I saw young, they weren't kids, they were young men, but 18 to 21 years old, uh, figuring out how to solve problems, how to, how to fight together. And they came from, it, it sounds hokey, but you know, it's true. They literally it's from everywhere, every corner of the country, right? Everywhere. I know. And when I hear about this wokeism infiltrating that and, and destroying that ethos, like that's intentional. They, the leftists that are pushing it want to destroy it. And boy, the Marine Corps has always been target number one for the left because it's the hardest culture to crack. Well, uh, it is, it is masculinity at its finest. It is as Jordan Peterson would say, you know, you, you should be a monster. But be that monster that controls it. And that was the beauty about, you know, going through boot camp. You were literally deconstructed mm -hmm. and then you were rebuilt. Right. But you weren't rebuilt to be some drones, the machine. They wanted thinking, fighting Marines. Yep. That's and right. one of the things that I, I don't know, and I will never forget this. You weren't black. You weren't white. You're not brown. You're dark green. You're <laughs> light green. You're just green. <laughs> everybody was green and For that was green and because i remember they looked at everybody you know they remember the drill instructors one time one guy in particular and i'll never forget his name drill instructor sergeant horn and i remember him because i had injured myself mid through boot camp i got dropped for like three days but i was like oh no there ain't no way i'm i'm no i started with you guys i'm leaving with you guys mm -hmm. yeah so got back up and i remember him he was talking to everybody in the uh, in the barracks one day, and he goes, "I want you to look around at everybody here." Of course, you know we're recruits, so yeah, yeah. be very careful. And he goes, "Those are your brothers. Everybody who has that EGA, that Eagle Globe and Anchor. Everybody right. who has walked through these halls. Those are your brothers. Those are your right. sisters. Never forget that. And, and that oath doesn't end. And I, I, I will right. never forget him telling us that." Because it was, and again, I'm like 19 years old at the time. Right. But the it it was a paradigm shift for me because it was like, man, I am a part of something bigger than myself. Right. And it, it, it it's life changing. It is. No, that was it. I mean, when it, what drew me in to the Marine Corps, and again, I, I respect all the services, but what drew me to the Marine Corps was you would see the guy in his truck with the EGA in the back. Um, and at the time when I was a kid, usually Vietnam ribbon there too. Um, and you're like, man, you know, he earned that, right? Like it's, it's, yep. it's this club that you can only get in if you actually pass the test and they accept you in. And then once you're in, like it's forever, like it's like, yeah. 
one of the comments says branded on your heart and it is and like that is an important culture and it carries forward and again so many of the things that i learned i said you know my service made me more practical in essence made me more conservative but made me understand like the way the world really worked um but like when you see the left again systematically working to rip that ethos apart right you, you really it kind of just lays it out for you to understand like what the goal is because what we're talking about the marine corps can be writ large across america yeah you don't have to yes, join be an american but like this idea that yes these are your fellow americans they are not your enemies like right. <laughs> we want them all to succeed you know if they succeed succeed more than i do great wonderful great. yeah i'm your I, biggest I, fan I, yeah <laughs> To share share your secrets with me sure like i want to hear the best the best of what you've done and like how others can replicate it but but we want people to succeed we should again feel that fellowship amongst each other those are the things that i learned in the marine corps that you learned that i would love to that i do try that's why i call the group no better friend share it with people so that they understand that ethos and again this is exactly what the left works against and when you hear them say that they want to fight against the concept of a colored blind society boy, if that doesn't hit you right between the eyes and understand what is happening right now, what is happening is a Marxist playbook being run on America to great detriment. And we, again, you know, why step up run right now? The reason is because you either feel like you can solve this thing um, or it's going to get a lot worse uh, very quickly. Well, and, you know, I, as I look around, man, we talked a little bit off air uh, about what I do privately and it, it it gives me a unique insight into market forces. It gives me a unique insight into a buyer's mind. Mm -hmm. And as I'm watching the last year, okay, let's go two years because we're talking COVID too. Right. But more so this last year, inflation has just gone through the roof. Yeah. We've seen the job number, the, the, the uh, what was it? The CPI went up to 8.3% last month. I'm waiting to see what happens the first week or two here in July, because I'm sure that's going to go through the roof. Yep. Uh, interest rates went up three quarters of a point. I'm sure they'll do it again come July. Mm -hmm. And I think we're in for a real bumpy ride. And anybody who goes to a grocery store, anyone who goes to the, to the pump, uh, you're seeing it, you're feeling it. Right. And when we take a look at what the causes of it is, we can, we can easily, say what it what it really was it's a breakdown of supply chain it is mass printing of money how though here in wisconsin if you're elected governor how can we try to insulate ourselves from things like that with these i think it's like out of control gas you know i know that's something that you've talked on before and other issues like there's got to be a way we can protect ourselves against this madness yeah yeah i know a couple things so i actually wrote an article on this like over a year ago on the constriction of labor, starting with that, right? Like, and in, in it, it's also energy. You take those two policies. First thing Joe Biden does upon coming president is he shuts off the Keystone pipeline, thereby beginning a process where he would do what he could to make fossil fuels as inconvenient and, and as expensive as possible. Separately, he would also pay people not to work as would Tony Evers, right? And in essence, and also to keep their kids home from school for almost two full years, such that many two income families decided, hey, we have to drop one of these two jobs because we got kids at home learning via Zoom. And so therefore they restructured their lives in ways that not everybody has simply gone back to work the way that it was before. So what we saw was a structural reduction in access to energy and labor. Guess what? Energy and labor are the two inputs into every product and service on the planet. So right. inflation was coming in addition to the monetary policy you're talking about right now. Joe Biden put this into play. Tony Evers was cheerleading it every step of the way. He's a lunatic that's saying he wants to decarbonize the economy of Wisconsin by 2050. The technology does not exist to do that. No. But it's an important point, though, because leftists like Evers have been saying crazy stuff like that now for a long time about how they're going to decarbonize economies. Here's the world, right? Like, look how expensive gas is. Americans do need to pay attention. The people of Wisconsin need to pay attention. So every time somebody tells you that they want to decarbonize things or they want to uh, you know, again, make it as inconvenient as possible for you to buy a car that runs in gasoline. This is what they're aiming for. Right. This is an intentional outcome of leftist policies. And of course, it's going to it's going to fuel in addition to just gasoline. It's going to fuel inflation on hold because, again, these inputs are so core to everything that we do and that we produce and that we use. So right. to get back to it. Like, what do we do now? Like, number one, you need a governor that's going to fight 
to actually get people back into the labor supply and get them working again and never again try to pay all of society to stay home for two years because that was crazy that that was even attempted. No matter what the issue was, COVID, that was not the solution. It was insane. And then separately, uh, number two, that's going to use the bully pulpit of the, of the governorship to fight for reasonable energy policy, which means getting as much cheap, clean energy into the system as possible. Guess what? Natural gas is clean and it's cheap and it's plentiful in America. And we need to be doing everything we can to open the spigot on natural gas and as well to oil because we should be energy self-sufficient because it yields greater economics, uh, excuse me, economic um, uh, growth, but also to peace. It tends to be when energy is plentiful, we're less likely to be in conflict. And of course, you see what's happening over in the Ukraine right now. Correct. And let's talk brass tacks. What can we do today? I've called for an elimination of the minimum markup on gasoline in the state of Wisconsin. So your, your uh, viewers may be aware of this, but basically there's a depression era law in Wisconsin uh, and literally passed in the 30s, which mandates that there is a 9.18% uh, markup on wholesale gasoline prices in the state of Wisconsin. Ostensibly, it was passed way back in the day because the, the lawmakers then said it would protect small businesses from large ones because large ones couldn't move in their market, sell for less than wholesale, drive them out of business, and then once they were gone, jack the prices up. That was what the claim was. Right. It's not the way this is really working. What, what's happening here today is um, uh, basically gasoline re retailers, the big ones realize nobody can compete with them on price, right? Because everybody's locked into minimum markup. So if you think about this as a business exercise, the goal is to just get big because no one's gonna catch you on price. And so right. they can compete on other variables like clean bathrooms, fresh donuts, which I'm all about, right? Like you should be able to compete on any metric, but price of gas should be one of those metrics. So what I'm calling for is let's eliminate that minimum markup right off the bat in Wisconsin. You'd see definite savings in gasoline and long term, it would introduce greater competition to the market the way it should be. The reason you don't hear other Republicans uh, calling for this right now, even though they should be, is that there's a very powerful lobby lobby that advocates for keeping this minimum markup. In fact, I think it's Woodman's right now is trying to sell gas cheaper. I and, saw that. Yeah. They're getting sued because they're trying to sell gas cheaper. So uh, my, my urge to Republican primary voters, wake up, open your eyes, pay attention to what's happening. If you don't hear other Republican candidates aggressively calling for the repeal minimum markup, why? Why isn't, you know, why aren't the Republican legislators asking for this? Because there's a powerful lobby that keeps it in place. That's why I believe we need more outsiders to step up and actually serve. And certainly. Now, Along with that, there's definitely other areas I think that people have kind of kicked it around. And I don't know if this, there was a, a governor's debate last night and it was up in the Green Bay area. I know there's another governor's debate that's going to be going on here July 24th down at the Marquette University area. Mm -hmm. um, but I've heard other candidates kick around this idea about eliminating or trying to transform the state income tax. Some people have said about trying to eliminate zero. But I think we we look at other states, you know, that tax is going to come from somewhere. Correct. Would something like that be beneficial here for Wisconsin? It's really it's a re it's, it's it's a spending issue. That's where we have to start with too. Mm -hmm. Anyone I think who starts this discussion and saying let's eliminate this tax, I say to them, okay, let's talk about what we're spending because you to your point. If you do this incorrectly, ultimately you could eliminate an income tax and massively spike the sales tax, right? Right. And all of a sudden we're in a whole nother predicament. And so what I've always said when this question comes up of just general tax reduction, our biennial budget for this past biennial was uh, $88.5 billion for a state of about five and a half million people. It's a lot of money being spent at this level every two years in the state of Wisconsin. What I want to do is come in as a governor and basically do a full on zero based budgeting project, which means start from zero. For every department, for every structure and every function of government, what should we really be spending? And I'm not going to say, and because I'm, I'm not going to lie to people that you're going to immediately going to get to perfect. I don't think you will. But I do think that through a process, you can start to apply pressure to say, look, the game here is not to say that you got X last time. So now you get X plus inflation, which, you know, inflation is massive. Mm -hmm. That's going to be the argument, right? Like, well, the Republicans only want to give you a 5% increase in government spending, but you know, the Democrats want 8%, right? Right. Usually what the debate is. The question is, are we even in the right ballpark and what we should be spending holistically? 
once you actually structurally reduce state spending and you say, actually, here's a, a more economical allocation to higher education, to uh, our roads, whatever the case is, here's what really does make sense long term. Then we can say, here's how we start to structurally reduce our taxes. And you can say income and property taxes should ultimately be reduced because we're very high in both. Now, right. it's like Florida have an advantage in that they've got a massive amount of, you know, we have tourism too. Dells are a great driver of economics in our entire state, but there's a scale of tourism that might be happening in some states like Florida that have no income tax where we don't necessarily have that scale necessarily. So we need to keep all that in, in mind as we make these decisions. Well, I think when you look at like our tourism, for example, it is very seasonal. You know, you have the summertime, you know, but it's also limited because you don't really hear about folks in Montana coming to Wisconsin. It's the northern Illinois folks or southeast Wisconsin going up north. And then, of course, during hunting season, well, there you might get everybody and their brother up here. Um, but that's very limited as compared to, say, Florida, which is just a destination year round. Um, oh, go ahead, please. No, I was going to say, and it's something I think the state could do a much better job, of, which is advocating. I think Wisconsin has been more aggressive in the past about advocating for tourism. I can tell you one of the things that the the, the some of the the key leaders in the Dells would say is that they need better roads to get people up here and get here faster and more efficiently, so that they don't dread driving on Wisconsin roads. I think that is important. Um, but ultimately, at the end of the day, yes, the state of Wisconsin does have an obligation to encourage people to come here year round because. We do have a debt. I mean, I keep talking about the Dells. The Dells has a lot of stuff that is 365 days a year, and it's done that way by design. We have hunting and fishing seasons that happen year round. It's a great winter destination if you like everything from snow shoeing to uh, cross country skiing to downhill skiing. So there's a lot of things we can do to encourage people to continue to come. But again, when you think about our budget holistically and you think about how do you really structurally reduce taxes, you got to look at spending first. You got to get spending down and then you can say, OK, now we can responsibly reduce our tax rates. Right. It, it really doesn't make sense. We have the tax rates we do and we have the quality of roads that we do. There's something wrong. Well, there's definitely a disconnect. And I don't think, you know, you and I couldn't live like that. Where our spending outpaces our income. Right. That's a spending problem. You it know, um, I want to get to this one here because I know we want to try to keep it to roughly about an hour. Sure. Um, this it's going to be a hot button topic because uh, as we go into the general, as we go into the primary, going leading to the general, um, with the gubernatorial candidate, and I think anybody else running, this is something I think needs to be addressed because it can never be allowed to happen again. Uh, 2020, it was ridiculous. Obviously, we had the COVID lockdown, 15 days of slow to spread. We had the Kenosha riots that ended up happening, mm -hmm. and there are stories I can tell you about that um, just from you know, from the lockdowns to people saying, oh, no, that'll never happen over here. Sure mm -hmm. enough, it did. Right. But we had a, I'll just call it what I believe it to be, a tyrannical government here in Wisconsin that shut down business, that mm -hmm. said, you're essential, you're not essential. Mm -hmm. And it was like, how dare you? Mm -hmm. Just because you work in the food service business does not mean you're non-essential. That is right. ridiculous. The lockdowns, you alluded to this earlier, kids were not going to school one of the most heartbreaking things and i don't cry over very much i just don't i the big joke for me is that i have no emotions and i saw this <laughs> video where these two kids they hadn't seen each other in like a year and a half they were maybe like six yeah. seven years old they ran to each other and they were hugging and crying and i ain't gonna lie a tear kind of came down my eye because the the mental damage that was done to so many people it was horrible. Substance right. abuse, alcoholism, you name it. Increased violence. This from, yeah. Oh, my God. Ridic DVs, uh, you name it. How do we prevent this from ever happening again? So uh, legislatively, one of the first things I'll demand from the state legislature is legislation that I can sign, which makes it clear that no future governor, no future county health official, no future county board has the power to issue mandates that in turn shut down the schools, shut down parts of the economy, shut down any of the economy, or uh, that try to mandate that people introduce new medical technology into their body on threat of losing their job if they don't. So literally what we need to do is proactively pass legislation to make sure that these things can't be done by fiat going forward. Because as you know, the Supreme Court struck down the federal 
attempt to use OSHA to force private employers to fire people. The Supreme right. Court shut that down. But there still is not proactive legislation in the state of Wisconsin that will forbid these things from happening again going forward. And what I always say to people is we have a legislative process, right? We have a process by which your elected legislators, if they wish to take action on something, they do so. They can pass legislation and a governor signs it. There is Our system is not designed to work such that a governor wakes up one day and decides that he wants to selectively decide what parts of the economy can be shut down and then does for over a year. Like right. That can't happen again. And likewise, too, it wasn't just the governor, although he was a huge part of this problem. You had county health officials doing this and just deciding, like you said, what was essential and what was not. And what we'll say, and again, there's a lot of lying going on over what happened over the past couple of years. But the reality was none of this helped, you know, shutting down schools, like destroying big parts of the economy, uh, wrecking people's mental health in so many different ways, creating a spike in violence that continues today. The bizarre attempt to undermine law enforcement that went alongside all of this, right? Which oh, that was ridiculous, of right? All of it. And so, I mean, look, leftism is very much founded and advanced in this concept of like, the more you can take people out of their comfort zone, the more you can turn them upside down, the more you can convince them to give up the things that they should know to fight for. That, that, and look, there is no doubt the left used COVID which was a real thing, of course, and did affect people personally. And I'm not making light of that in any way, shape or form, but they used COVID to, in, to indoctrinate and to destroy so much of our society. And we're still dealing with the effects and we will, we will for many years. So to answer your question directly, we need to pass legislation to make sure that future governors, elected officials, county boards, whatever, can't do this again. Right. Well, you know, and it was interesting because I remember on the onset of this, um, I get it, you know, people were scared. I, I totally understand that. Right. 15 days is slow to spread. Eh, whatever. Okay, cool. Wash your hands. That was probably the best thing that came Wash out. Wash your hands. By the way. Wash it's your amazing. hands. Right. We had to have a national pandemic to get people to wash their hands. Yeah. <laughs> but that's what it was in March. It was like, don't unnecessarily like, you know, interact until we kind of got a better sense of what's happening here. Right. Make sure you wash your hands. Like, fair. Got it. Because we saw what happened in Italy, right? And it's like, oh my gosh. It was horrible. In all circumstances, you can see healthcare overrun, and that's a real bad thing. So people can't get uh, treatment. So this kind of like this is what we're also taught in the Marine Corps, which is like take an 80-20 approach, kind of understand what's happening in the world, and then assess, learn, and then adapt. Right. What our leaders leaders could not do was any of what I just said. What they did is they blocked their brains into you know this is this is the way we must do this, and what they decided they were going to do was shut down society. And boy, again, I always say the comparison is the Brits who literally continued to go to school and work while the Germans were bombing London uh, every day and night. Like, right. but they moved forward because they had, because the alternative was destruction. And likewise too, you just can't wake up one day and decide, okay, we're gonna stop 70% of society and just stay home. You can't. And, and, and again, I would have expected that we had more adults in positions of leadership to say this is not a solution that is in any way, shape or form tenable. Well, I would have thought we would have had more adults overall. Yeah, and right. Yeah. What I mean by this here and, 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 and this will be my final question here for you before we uh, before, you know, I want to turn it over to you and definitely give you the last word here. Sure. Um, but one of the things that I that I found so disturbing was how literally split down the middle, how polarized we became. You had a group of people, and I probably count myself amongst those. It's like, if you want to wear a mask, by all means, God bless you, have fun mm -hmm. with that. If you don't, don't. But I'm not going to stop living. You know, <laughs> bills don't pay themselves, and, you know, money don't make itself. I got responsibilities, and, you know, little boy needs to know that dad's got to put in work. Right. But then you had another group of people that wanted to be controlled. I mean, literally, they wanted to be told what to do. Um, I remember, you know, Dr. Fauci talking about, you know, wear a mask, don't wear a mask. And I think he had a lot of credibility on the onset. But as things started changing and it got really weird, I swear these things got really questionable. But still, people were, they wanted to be told what to do. They didn't want to be free. And, and I think that's the hard thing. How, how do we how do we break into that and get these people to realize this is your birthright that you're giving up? Right. 
No, that's it. Right. And, and again, this is kind of a this is going back to this idea of conservatism and what the belief is, is that on Earth here, the individual is sovereign. And that is a fundamental different differently uh, way of looking at life and existence that you will find in other you know, societies. Like, for example, the society that's enforced by the Chinese Communist Party, which has a very different view of the value of an individual. And what we believe is, yes, you should take threats to health very seriously because it can harm individuals, but you cannot basically take away people's rights and their ability to live in existence, you know, by the demand of the government. And so ultimately individuals have to make decisions, which means, again, in our republic, we, we do have a republic. Um, there's an opportunity for legislators to legislate, for executives to, to enact legislation. But we didn't really see that stuff happen. We just saw summary mandates issued. And so again, to your point, power was just immediately taken away from people and way too many people, particularly those on the left side of the uh, political spectrum said, that's fine. Because they, you know, at the end of the day, were being told that if they didn't, they were terrible people. So there's a lot of social shaming that was going on as well too. Again, in a world where we keep hearing from people, we should follow the science. Not many people were actually paying attention to the fact that there weren't very appreciably different outcomes between places that were locking themselves down and places that were not. That should have been a real discussion very, very much, much sooner than it was. And, uh, and right, and the evidence of what was happening with kids, that kids weren't affected the same way that other people were that were older and that had comorbidity issues were affected. And so a rational discussion should have had been had about like, okay, how do we make sure kids are being educated and that the most disadvantaged kids aren't falling down and, and falling behind even more so than they already were. So in so many ways, yes, you saw this polarization became very political. And if you want a classic example of it, right, that really just kind of hits you in the face, go back to that uh, vice presidential debate where Kamala Harris oh, was yeah. asked about the vaccine, right, the vaccines that were still in, in production. Um, she said she'd never take it because President Trump played a role in producing it. Correct. Fast forward about nine months from the time she said that in that debate and it was that administration the biden harris administration that was attempting to get people fired from their jobs if they did not immediately take that new medical technology into their body and there you see how much this was politicized and so to your point it became this thing where you know you're not on my team you're not doing the practice that i think is the right practice therefore you're a terrible person who's going to get other people killed Instead of saying, like, actually, how do we get the world moving again in a way that's safe, but also, too, doesn't destroy our society, which is what we all should have been aiming at. And so, right. again, you get back to these concepts of critical race theory and what the left is up to and what, the, you know, heck, forget forget our country for a moment. Look at um, the USSR, right? This is the playbook of the left. They did it there, too. They separated people by ethnicity, pitted them against each other. Um, and at the end of the day, that's how they maintain power. That's what we saw here in the United States of America as the left tried to use COVID to pit people against each other and then to usurp power. Unfortunately, they were very successful. They did a lot of damage and we have a lot of work to do to get the world back on track. Well, like you said earlier, we got to get started on it now. And it's just yeah. time to get here. And we really, we really don't have time to wait. We got a primary coming up here August 9th. And before now and then, obviously, there's going to be a lot of, you know, a lot of people talking, a lot of different events. Tomorrow, sure. you're making a couple of rounds. I believe you're going to be in Portage County at the Republican County, uh, at the Portage County Republican Party's office, all right, for a meet and greet, if I recall correctly. Yes, then, I'm looking right now because you caught me unaware and where I'm going to be. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wrote it on down and everything because like, um, because I got <laughs> note of that somebody informed me and I'm like, Oh no, I'm gonna go to Green Lake County here later. That there's a pints of politics yeah, there, will be Green Lake County. Um, if you guys check it out, it's near Ripon, and it's at a place called the Goose Blind. It's in the upstairs yep. uh, area there. So if you want to check it out, it's 512 Gold Street, and that's in Green Lake, Wisconsin. Beautiful area. You guys need to check yeah. it out if you haven't been there. Uh, so I'm definitely looking forward to seeing yourself there, and I know other people will be there. It's just the same. Absolutely. We're going to hit Oneida County, too, and we're going to go to Wapaka as well, too, before we see you. Uh, oh, you guys so are all over the place. Couple, yeah, we got a couple stops tomorrow, so it'll, it'll be a good day. Here's a fun story real quick. I was uh, We were down in Montello for their Lincoln Day dinner, and I was talking with uh, 
your communications director. And poor, poor thing. She was like just tired. And you guys <laughs> had done like, I don't know, ridiculous amount of hours on the road. I just kind of looked at him like, nap time, huh? Yeah. She's like, <laughs> nah, not happening. <laughs> I feel you, sister. I'm, I'm yeah. I can't beg on you for that. It's going to be long and intense and intense. Well, and like I told everybody, you know, I want to thank you for your service, both as a Marine um, and, of course, as a candidate running for office, because uh, this last year has really shown me a lot behind the curtain. Um, it's one thing to sit here behind a microphone and be overly critical. It's another to see behind the curtain, see what the candidates go through, find out what makes things work, how it ticks. And mm -hmm. you guys really put in a lot of work, a lot of hours. And, you know, stepping up, like I said, you put yourself under the microscope, your lives are on hold, your families are under the microscope, just the same, right, wrong, or indifferent. And I want to make sure, like I said, everybody that I've talked to, I thank you guys for that, because it is definitely inspiring. And that's why I want to keep these conversations going, because the relationship building, as we talked about earlier, is so important and bringing out this human element, you know, for yourself and others. Oh, well, thank you, Ed. And thanks for doing this show. Thank you for your service to our country. But thanks for doing this because you don't always get venues where you can actually have like a reasonable exchange of ideas. There's a lot of like 20 second clips and like you got a couple of right. minutes point on like very complicated issues. And it gets really hard. Right. And then you, you're always facing a headwind from the media that's willing to take the not willing, eager to take two words out of sequence any which way they can to try and misinterpret what you really mean. So it's meaningful to have a forum like this. And I appreciate you doing it. You know, like I said, if we can provide some value, education, and a laugh or two, we're going to take that and run with it. That's right. going to be a big W. So right. the last couple minutes here, I'm going to hand this over to you uh, because you're running for governor. I'm just a dude in the middle of nowhere with a podcast. <laughs> so I'm going I'm to give you the full screen. You go ahead and lay it down, and I'm going to pull myself off here right now. All right. Good deal. Well, thank you again. And, and, and what I'd say to everybody is like, look, this conversation, I think, allowed us to talk and to illuminate about many of the challenges we face, but the challenges we face are very real. And they do. They range from education where we're seeing not near the proficiency that we should have in Wisconsin schools. We are seeing kids taught intellectual poison that needs to be stopped. We do need to institute universal school choice. When it comes to law and order, we need mandatory minimums for bail and for sentencing, for violent charges and for violent convictions because charge people and under apply bail in the case of people that are potentially or convicted to actually rebuild our law enforcement. We need a governor that's going to go to all 72 counties and talk to kids. Enforcement. We do need to fix our elections because at the end of the day, we saw ballot harvesting and ballot drop -off happen because it's illegal in the state of Wisconsin to take or to give a ballot to anyone should have happened. That's why we need to get rid of the Wisconsin Elections Commission, transfer the power to the secretary. Clear loss. So we have no more ballot harvesting, no more drop boxes, no more introduction of private funds in our. But well, we got to win the election in November 1st. We got to be Tony Evers, which means we need a candidate on the ballot. Views as conservatives and then showing how we want to fight for people, their families and their future. State is that if you're serious about actually winning in November, about getting on statewide general elections, and you're serious about getting our society back on track, then I'm your at the status quo. And you don't want to see any serious shakeup of what we're facing right now in the world and in the primary. But ultimately, I ask for your vote so that we can fight together to actually get our world back on track. Ed, thank you again. Thank you very much. I have to change it up here because I got to get yeah. your name there in profile. Ticker here is Nicholson for Wisconsin. Make sure you check it out. Obviously, he's going to be here and there. <laughs> but, uh, Kevin, thank you very much. I always appreciate the time that we have thank to you. talk. Back on. I uh, always welcome you back. Um, awesome. It just, I, again, I appreciate you so All right. Thank you, sir. Have a good one and uh, be safe on the road, sir. Thank you. You too.
All right, guys, that was Kevin Nicholson. He's running for governor here in the great state of Wisconsin. So make sure you uh, check out the website there. If you want to, if you like what you heard here, make sure you volunteer, donate, help out. Yard signs are going to be all over the place. So make sure you check, look into that as well, too. But I want to thank you guys for joining us here tonight. This episode will drop July 30th, 8 p.m. YouTube, like, share, subscribe, and I'll see you guys all here on the next episode. Talk to you soon.